Well, in this session, we're going to talk about fractures of the tibia in children. And there are some that need aggressive treatment. Certainly, you would think that this one needs aggressive treatment. It's markedly displaced and angulated. And this one required a closed reduction. In other words, it required uh, pretty active activity. Now, and there may be many fractures here on the proximal metaphysis, and that may be undisplaced, and that will create a, this common scenario. Here you can see this looks like just a simple undisplaced fracture. And all it needs is a simple long leg cast. Whoa, what happened here? What happened? You had a valgus deformity. Yes, yes. And you, the mother is, she's pretty upset. She said, you didn't set it right. Is that true? No. No, right. So he said, oh, I forgot to tell you, these fractures cause the big bone to grow faster, causing it to be crooked. Now oh, you're just saying that because you didn't set it right in the first place. So, you know, I think the message here is best to explain that this is a biological phenomena, and it occurs, and you just tell them this before you start the treatment. And if it occurs, then they'll say, you know, he's pretty smart. He told us what's going to happen. So, what about fractures of the proximal tibia metaphysis? Well, this is a fracture that needs special attention. First, we need to tell the parents that they have a tendency to overgrow immediately. So, what causes, what do they seem to really realize that causes these overgrowth? Well, I think there's the um, uh, iatrogenic etiology yeah, right. as well as biological. Yeah, that's right. There's iatrogenic, and what would that be? Well, uh, maybe there are times where it isn't set right. That's right. Then, yeah, that's right. And the mother says you didn't set it right, and she's right. She's correct. Okay, and there are biological conditions, and this is actually determined by a higher power. This is a biological phenomenon of which we don't have a lot of control. So here's an iatrogenic condition, and what happened here? What's your assessment here? This, this patient's in a cast, you can't see it very well, but this patient was just simply put in a fiberglass cast. Would you accept that? Uh, no. Yeah, so this patient had an inadequate reduction and the angulation wasn't fully corrected at the fracture site. So actually it was really bad because he had a combination of medial overgrowth plus the, he didn't set it right. That's right. So the mother here would have some justification for um, fussing at the, uh, the accusing the uh, surgeon. And this produced a severe angulation. Well, let's look at the biological condition. The growth of the tibia has asymmetric growth proximally. Distally is pretty symmetric. And uh, this overgrowth is just usually temporary. It occurs right after you have some type of stimulation. It can occur most commonly after fractures, but I've also seen when you, it's occurred uh, with osteomyelitis, and years ago we used to get bone graft up there, and that would cause it to do anything that stimulates the increased circulation. So in the proximal tibia, you can see that there's more growth. This occurred after a fracture. You can see the Harris Park growth arrest lines when you compare it with the normal side, the Harris Park growth lines, you can see that there's really a demonstration that you have more growth. Now, remember the overgrowth is asymmetric. And the medial is more than the lateral. And here's a good example. At five months, what's that line called again? The Harris Park growth lines? Yeah, yeah. And that occurs whenever you have a... Uh, an injury and, and it's immobilized or you have a sickness and it's mobilized and you'll have a nice increase in bone formation because of the slowdown and those were described by Harris and Park. And they, they're, they're good to tell you that it's growing. And what's happening here? Well, here it is, 16 months. What's happening? You have more growth on the medial. That's right, exactly right you have more growth on the medial side. Well, you made this observation 
Overgrowth? Why? Now you're going to tell me why. Some people say that the blood supply on the medial side is more after the injury. Perfect. That's exactly right. The present theories are there's greater medial flow, and this was by the late John Ogden. He did some vascular studies and found there was more blood supply on the medial side than the lateral supply, so thus it's more susceptible to overgrowth. We do know that fractures will be stimulated in overgrowth after uh, fractures. Now, at one time, it was thought that the fibula served as a tether mechanism. Is that true? What well, do you see in this fracture? Well, both are fractures, so it certainly cannot be a tether. That's exactly right. It's tethering by the fibula. And initially, when they put him in the cast, the tibia was well aligned. And he thought that this, since the fracture was in the fibula, you don't have the tethering effect. And the fibula was completely fractured, so there's no tether effect. And despite all this, this is truly a cause? Well, not really, because this patient went on to develop the typical valgus deformity. And there's a valgus actually uh, should be occurred and not recurred. So the tethering of the fibula is not a reason. So if you look at the development of the formula, actually there's more uh, angulation in that first year, and usually that stimulation disappears after the second year. So the maximum overgrowth is in that first year, and its growth is actually almost a centimeter, which produces a significant valgus. So the treatment is, what is the basic reduction process? What do you have to do? You have to do a nice ferrous mold. Yeah, that's exactly right. First, you have to obtain a reduction, and then you have to maintain it. And many of these are un, undisplaced, so you, all you do is put the cast on. But you, you said that you, when obtaining the reduction, you do this various mold. You apply the fracture. When reducing the fracture and applying the cast, you put a various mold on. And uh, a good friend of mine who works in Stuttgart, Germany, said he, when he did this, he didn't have the overgrowth. He felt it works. I'm not sure that's true. That's not been my experience and the experience of others. But here you can see. Now, you have to maintain the reduction and where are you going to pad? Same place. You're going to pad over the points of, of pressure. So when you're doing that, you put a various mold on the cast. Now, all right, here's a one-year post-fracture. And the leg's crooked. And this mother, bless her heart, comes back and says, what about my daughter's leg? It's crooked. And what is? what are we supposed to do in orthopedics? What does orthopedics mean? Straighten the bones. Straighten the child. Pedia. It comes from two Greek words, ortho, which is straight, pedia, and is his child. So that's our goal, is to straighten it. So how are you going to straighten it? You going to do an you going to do an osteotomy? No, while they're still as immature. Well, she says you need to straighten it, and he wanted to, this doctor that saw this child. She kept bugging him, and she wanted he wanted to shut her up, and so. He did it. He did a closing wedge osteotomy. And initially you see a good result and good alignment. Would you agree? It's straight. Yeah, it's offset. It's got a little translocation, but the appearance is, is straight. And you, here's the original growth arrest line. And now the mother's happy. And she said, boy, you're wonderful. The leg is now straight. And so she's the doctor's friend again. So, but what's going to happen? The valgus deformity. Reverse. Because you have you created a iatrogenic fracture, which increases the circulation. So the same thing is going to recur. And here you can see a year later comes in, and you can see that's what the original growth the rest. Those are the new asymmetrical growth lines, and the mother is no longer your friend. And what does she say? Well, you just didn't do the surgery right. So, what is it best to do? Uh, to wait and watch. Yeah, there's some good studies to show you just need to wait. So I remember this girl, and actually, this is the picture after she had mother had left, and she was incriminating another doctor who had treated it that he didn't set it right. 
And I thought, I told her the best thing to do is just wait. And actually the mother came back as a 15 year old, brought in her child. And I remember the name and I said, I remember you, let me take a picture. And what's happened? The correction occurred at the physis. You still have a little shaped tibia, but she looks straight. And you can see that as we talked about, when we talked about remodeling, the correction occurred at the physis. And now you have a happy mother and she's a little bit older. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you were right to correct or right to wait. So here's a 50, uh, an older child, looks like she's about uh, 11 or 12 and it's persisted, has not corrected. So what are you going to do? You're going to do another osteotomy? No. Is there another technique that you can do? Uh, Hemipiphysis. Hemipiphysis, yeah, that's very good. And years ago, when we, the only thing we had were staples, and it was corrected with staples. You can see that that grew actually on that side. Actually, it was in valgus, and you can see that that valgus angulation has corrected. It grew a little bit more on the lateral side, and now we have the newer eight plates that we'll use. So here is the thing you need to say at the beginning. These fractures cause the big bone to grow faster, to be crooked. And this will occur despite the best of treatment. And if you do that and it happens, the mother will say, you know, you're pretty smart. You told me this is gonna happen instead of you didn't set it right. Okay, now we're going a little bit more distal and we'll talk about fractures of the shaft of the tibia. And you're here, you can see. So. What information is essential to treat these injuries? Um, soft tissue, whether it's open or not. Yeah, that's that's one. Um, but most of them are in children are closed. Uh, how much uh, growth potential they have? Yes, that's another thing. What about the fracture pattern? You have to understand a little bit the muscle forces that occur here. And you need to know what's acceptable as far as angulation is concerned. And you need to know the principles of treating the specific fracture types. All right, that brings up the point. Let's look at the muscle forces. The effects of the muscles depend on the integrity of the osseous structure. Now, what are the three fracture patterns? Do you know? Transverse. Yes. Oblique or spiral. Well, yes, there's, that's right. Oblique oh. is usually spiral occurring in the shaft. There's the isolated tibia fracture, and that's usually uh, due to a rotation, and the fibula is intact. There's the fractures of both the fibula and tibial shafts, and that's usually a transverse fracture pattern. That's usually a severe bending force, and usually occurs as a more severe uh, injury. A bleak fracture pattern, and uh, Actually, the oblique fracture pattern is actually the third type, and the fourth type are stress fractures, and those are treated just with waiting them out, so we're not going to really spend much time on those. So this is the most common one, is the isolated tibial shaft fracture, and it occurs in this child. You see this child is probably about five or six years of age, and usually they're running and they catch their foot and they'll twist, and they'll have just a twisting motion. So it's usually a rotational injury with an oblique fracture pattern. And so what, what are the muscle forces that are affecting here? What's the major? The flexors and extensors? Yeah, but the biggest one is the flexors. And that's actually, a, uh, crosses two joints. It crosses, it starts, it originates in the distal femur and then attaches across the ankle to the calcaneus. So, What's the major deformity that occurs with this? What happens here? You get a flexion deformity at the fracture side? Well, yeah, a little bit. What else? Oh, uh, in a varus. That's right, that's right. What happens here, you have this shortening effect of the gastroxoleus, but here you have a tethering because of the intact fibula, and so that shortening, the intact fibula presents the shortening laterally so you see here, what you have is that you have unequal forces. You don't have any, you have the tethering of the fibula prevents much in the way of shortening on the lateral side, but you do have 
of the more muscle forces that will cause it to do. So that converses the muscle from one of shortening to one of rotation, and that produces a varus uh, deformity. So here you have boaster tibia and fibular shafts. What's the deformity here that you're going to get? You have to worry about valgus deformity. Yeah, valgus. Really, the extensor muscles are anterior, as you can see here. The extensor muscles are really anterior. They're a little bit anterior lateral, but the force here is anterior, and that produces a valgus force because they're anterior and lateral, and that produces a valgus force. And so here you can see this is a typical transverse fracture here, and usually these are hit by as a bending type of motion that occurs. You can see there's an oblique failure pattern here, and the fibula is intact here. It's not intact, but it's fractured here. And so with this, you have the external muscle forces really producing unequal. The, tip, the gastroc soleus will produce shortening, but the lateral, anterior lateral muscle forces will do that. Okay, now you suppose you, you have a really bad twisting and you'll have oblique fractures in both shafts. What do you worry about? Shortening. That's right. Here you can see initially this was just three millimeters. And this patient was placed in a long leg cast with a knee extended. And you said it was liable to get shortening, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's no cord really good cortical contact. And you're right, this patient came back a week and the pull of the gastric soleus produces extra shortening. And now this patient is one is 15 millimeters, which is not acceptable. So speaking of acceptable, what are the limits? There's very little overgrowth in the tibia post fracture. You know, we can accept easily uh, almost two centimeters uh, in the femur but how much can we do it in the tibia? Less than a centimeter? That's right. Yeah, if you look at, here's a patient that was, you see the overgrowth. Again, you have your Harris Park growth rest lines. It tells you how much it's grown. That's how much it's grown two years post fracture. It averages about four tenths of a millimeter. And you see that there's really pretty equal in here if the fracture is distal or in the mid shaft. It's almost equal, but if you go distally, you can see that there is actually an overgrowth of about five millimeters. So this is uh, uh, the acceptability that was put out by Steve Heinrich, and he said less than eight years, you can accept quite a bit of, you can accept about 10 degrees of anterior angulation and posterior angulation, and about 10 millimeters of shortening because you do have a little bit more remodeling in the tibia in less than eight. But certainly if from eight or more, you can't really accept much. So very little shortening can be accepted. That's one thing you have to worry about. So what can be accepted? Well, what about bayonet apposition? Can you accept that? I you know, we, so. we talked about you can accept bayonet apposition in the forearm, Here's a patient that came in with bayonet apposition, and there's really almost no shortening because this spike is just about equal here. That's probably half a centimeter. And it looks like the alignment's pretty good. Can you accept that, or do you need to go back and operate on it? What do you need to do? It's not a very old child. Well, actually, as long as there's no compromise of the skin, and you have, you've met the criteria for length, and angulation, it usually remodels. Here it is in two months, and you can see that here's the torn peri, where the torn periosteum is, and it's filled in, and this will start to remodel. So you can accept bayonet apposition if the other criteria are there. Now, let's look at each of these fracture types, and each one has a very different um, uh, method of treatment. That's why it's important that you first determine the fracture type, then you can determine what treatment, because each one of these has a specific treatment protocol. Now, conservative management, and we really, most children fractures can be managed conservatively. 
a closed fracture of the tibia. When was the last one you last time you treated it operatively? Mm, a while ago. Yeah. You too? Yeah, I'd say pretty it. rare. You know, maybe one or two a year and we'll talk about the when you need to do it. But most of them you in the emergency room, what do you do? You, if they meet the criteria you put them in a cast. So now this is one, the most common one that you're going to see is this isolated tibial shaft. And almost all these can be managed conservatively. For, and exactly, there's really no good way to control the tibia operatively, non-operatively, because you really can't put much rotational pressure. Remember, what kind of problem do you get with an isolated tibia fracture, I believe? Uh, the overgrowth or the shortening. Yeah, shortening with rotation. Rotation. Yeah, you get rotation, and there's really not much way you can uh, co control that. So here's the patient post-reduction, and you need this is something you need to explain to him again beforehand that this will actually go into a little bit of varus because of that ro the rotational forces that will go into varus, but usually in <coughs> three months. Usually it's not enough that it produces any clinical deformity, so you just watch them. And when you show the x-rays to the parents, you tell them that this is normal. The only way I could correct that is going to have to do a plate and, or some screws, and you tell them, usually they don't want their child operated on. But you tell them beforehand that the x-rays will show a little angulation, but it's usually clinically not of any significance. Now you need to be careful, though, you need to look, there may be some plastic deformation. And the plastic deformation here was in the fibula. And so this one created both an angular and a rotational deformity. And here you can see the marked rotation that occurs when you compare the thigh foot angle here and here the thigh foot angle is negative. So you got this rotational force and you got also a little bit of shortening, but most of this is rotational plastic deformation. So, how do you treat plastic deformation? Well, what you have to do, you apply a force over a fulcrum. We talked about that when we discussed plastic deformation, which most commonly occurs in the radius and ulna diaphyses. So you apply a force over a fulcrum, that's why you need to do it under general anesthesia, and you put three-point pressure on it, and you get it gradually, and sometimes it'll take about two minutes, a continuous motion here, and this will usually correct that plastic deformation. Now, <clears throat> let's go to the other type, which is both tibia and fibular shafts, and they have a tendency to go into valgus, right? Yes, sir. You can see here. So this you need to put a, come, again, you have to put a various mold in it, just like with the proximal tibia and you hope that will control it. But if you don't put a good mold on it, here it is, precast, various mold was applied. Uh-oh, that's not acceptable. It's greater than 10 degrees in the child, this child. So what are you gonna do? You gotta take that cast off, you're gonna operate, or what are you gonna do? You could wedge the cast. Wedge it, yeah. And you, uh, that's an old technique that I think has kind of been forgotten but it's very effective in the tibia. You can wedge the cast. Here you can wedge the cast and see that you can get the alignment. And this one still met the one centimeter of shortening and the alignment's been corrected. And you just wedge the cast. So, and here you can see you've got the alignment. So you be sure you pat it when you do that. When you put the cast on, always put a little extra padding over the malleoli because you may need to wedge them even if you put a good cast on. Now, you got an oblique fracture, and what's the major concern here? They'll shorten. That's right, and so you gotta watch them. Here's one, and what do you need to do to prevent the shortening? What is it that's causing the shortening mainly? They don't have any cortical contact. Yeah, but I mean, what muscle forces? The flexors. Yeah, right, the gastroxoleus. And so you need to neutralize the force of that gastroxoleus because it's the one that's really pulling it. So how do you do that? Flex the knee and uh, plant Yeah, you flex. place the limb of the cast with knee flexed and a little bit of aquinas. And children can 
tolerate that Aquinas. It doesn't, they usually stretch out. Adults don't, but the children usually will do that. So you relax it, and what else are you going to do? Give it a varus mold. Well, that, you give them a varus mold. And what else? When are you going to have them come back? One week. Yeah, you're not going to have them come back in six weeks. That's right. You need to have them come back. And so you need to follow closely with serial x-rays for progressive shortening. So, methods of surgical management actually degrees presents in the degrees of invasiveness. You can do a closed reduction with percutaneous fixation, or you can do external fixation alone, or open reduction with internal fixation. Okay, let's look at closed reduction percutaneous fixation, which is probably the most common one that we can use in the child. In the adults, you're pretty aggressive and you'll, you'll do a lot more tendency to put plates on and so forth, but children don't um, tolerate them. Their skin's kind of thin and they have a tendency to actually um, lose the skin over the plate and they'll come in the, opera, the clinic with a, the shiny plate showing. So you can use cross pins. We use this for years, but they're easy to apply and remove and they're usually but more useful in metaphyseal areas and there's a little bit more chance of infection when you use cross pins, but it's really not very stable. It's just a kind of a temporary stitch. And this is maybe the one place that you could use them. So they may not, this distal tibial metaphyseal fractures may not be as simple to manage. Now, you got this fracture. How are you going to mobilize it? What are you going to do about the ankle? What position? Planner, I think I'll, uh, well, it's extended. Now, so you know, I we were taught that you always put it in, in neutral. But you're going to put it in plantar flexion? No, I put it in dorsiflexion. Yeah, it's okay. You put it in dorsiflexion, what's happened? Yeah, these have a tendency to angulate, have a posterior apex angulation. And originally, what did you say you were going to do? Plantar flexion? Yeah, that's right. You need to be careful about these. You don't want to, this is one place where you violate that rule of putting them in neutral. And actually, that's what's happened. So now you have placed it in 45 degrees of flexion and actually that's fixed it. So now the mother's a little bit happier. It's much better. Okay, this patient sustained a severe bending injury and <clears throat> this patient had, you were able to reduce it, but it had lots of soft tissue swelling. You think you can control that with a cast alone? No. What would you do? put a plate on it, on a two-year-old. Uh -huh. I'm not sure they make plates that small. Well, this made cast stabilization almost impossible because it was so swollen. So what are your retreatment options here? I guess you could pin it? Yeah, yeah, very good. This is one place where percutaneous pins is good because you just need a kind of a temporary stitch. At two years old, that's metaphyseal bone, and that's going to heal very rapidly. So cross bands were placed percutaneously, and that provided good temporary stabilization until it heals, because that age is going to heal very rapidly. So here's another example of cross pin fixation, and this wasn't very good. There should have been cross pins instead of two this way, but this is one that one that was very difficult to do and use cross pins, and it shouldn't would be better if there had been cross pins rather than two pins like this. But in children, that's metaphyseal bone and that's going to heal pretty rapidly. So AP pins were used. In some guys, a plate may be useful. Here, here this patient had angulation and failed even with wedging, and so they reserved to a plate. There's one place that you want to put a plate on, one type of pit fracture. Uh, <coughs> And that's a hemophiliac because you want to, you can treat them, the clotting mechanism during the operation in the first day or so post op. But if you put an external fixator on them, then you got to treat them a lot longer because they'll continue to bleed where the pins are. So this patient had an ipsilateral femoral shaft and 
a uh, distal tapestial fracture. So, what are you going to do here? Can you just treat them with the cast? You're going to treat the, we talked in the last session about two years old, you can treat them with a spike of cast. Can you treat this one with a spike of cast? So, you know, maintenance of the fracture with a spike of cast. Is there any treatment that you can use? Well, this fracture was to build with IM nails. And with IM nails, you can go get that stable fracture and do it. You have to, remember, you have to do a little bit of twisting so that you have two. Uh, uh, on, the, on, on the medial one, you just have a simple curve. And on the latter one, you've got to have two curves so that you have spreading at the fracture side, that you have a fracture side. And if you've got a real short fragment, don't hesitate to go through the vices because with the smooth pins, it's been shown that it really doesn't cause much problem. So cross pins are a first poor course for diaphyseal fractures. Before we had intermediary pins and so forth, this is what we did. But <clears throat> really, it's not a very stable construct and they have a tendency to fall off. So it's not a very stable construct. Now this one has 10-year-old with severe swelling and has bulleye here. <clears throat> you gonna put a cast on that? No, sir. No. What would you do here? You gonna use an external fixator? Uh, probably not. Yeah. See, both shafts, both, both shafts had oblique fracture lines. So it was felt that this fracture had a high risk to shorten because you really can't put a well-molded cast on it. So we use large IM nails to fill the cowl, thus that minimized the tendency to shorten. And these were the old Ender's rods rather than the flexible nails, which you can see this one filled the canal and this kind of prevented the shortening. Now, this patient here, that was a real challenge. This patient was uh, had a degloving injury. He got caught behind a truck and was dragged for about 25, 30 feet, and this is the way it came in. <laughs> Doctor, is it fractured or is it broken? <laughs> <laughs> What's your concern here? What's going to be the first thing you have to do? Remove all the dead tissue. Yeah, you need to call the plastic surgeon. So we did, and what did he do? Yeah, he took off all the dead tissue, which is, you really need to do that. So, but he still got a fracture. So how are you going to, this, this had a fracture, how are you going to treat this? How are you going to stabilize without compromising the soft tissue? This was the fracture this patient had. And so we used flexible intermedullary nailing, permitted excess and provided stability. Actually, it was retrograde nailing. And at this point, this was years ago, in which we used K-wires. And so it is at six months post-op, he had he had a flap to cover the skin and skin graft, and the fracture went on to heal. So this was prior, before we had commercially produced flexible nails. So, and this was a 13-year-old Hispanic female from an outside hospital, and she was struck by an automobile, and here she came to our university hospital. She was in good health prior to her injuries, but she had a closed head injury and with a ventricular monitor inserted, and she was intubated and sedated. And so she was evaluated and by the <coughs> emergency room, and they saw she had multiple injuries, which included two tibial fractures. Here you have a proximal oblique tab fracture and fibular metaphyseal fractures. And here you had a distal one oblique with tibia and fibre fractures. So, and she's got a, a neurological injury. Can you treat these with a cast? No, not that she's, she's... Yeah, okay. This one, what kind of nailing are you going to do? Probably flexible nails. If yeah, she's but how, where are you going to put them? Are you going to do antegrade or retrograde? Um. You know, the, the, the party line that's in the textbook is that you always in tibia, you always do them antegrade. Okay, so the treatment with this one was antegrade nails, and that seemed to hold it. Now, this one, 
what's your problem here? Well, it turned out this was impinged in tissue and it needed to be open, but can you get good fixation in that proximal fragment? Not really. Okay, what is the problem if you're going to put retrograde needles? They're prominent down at the bottom. Well, uh, they're prominent, but also putting it in. So, this was retrograde nails, but what's down there at your entrance site? Well, you have to make a pretty good incision because you have to look for the anterior tibial artery and nerve and retract them, and that's why you don't do a retrograde nailing in the tibia. We do it routinely, as we talked about the last session in the femur and in the distal radius and ulna, but we don't do it in the tibia, and the reason is you have your neurovascular bundle and you have to make a bigger incision. So we did ha have it open, avoid the neurovascular structures. And here's the AO technique, which you use the two proximal moon and the entrance point as you do perpendicular, then gradually, while you're moving it, you get it up, start at 90 degrees, start perpendicular. And then while drilling, you always make sure while you're drilling, because if you angulate it, Without drilling, you'll break that tip off. And you start the nail passage, take them down to the fracture site, and then cross the fracture site, and the final seating is down in the metaphysis with a uh, cross pin. And here you can put two pins, because you're both medial and lateral. You can see both pins. Now, the, what's the risk with IM nails? Well, this patient had a trench fracture, and uh, they did IM nails, but this patient had a little anterior angulation. Why? Because their nails had uh, that angulation. Yeah, when you when you before you put the nails, what do you do? Bend them. In you the bend them, and you need to make sure, as we talked about the femur, that you keep that bend in the coronal plane. If it shifts to the sagittal plane. You need to check at the end, if it shifts to the sagittal plane, then, of course, what will happen, and you can see down here, this is the tip is here, and so this is in the sagittal plane, and so that may produce an angulation in the sagittal plane. So a posterior rotation produces this recurvatum. Uh, okay, now, there are times when you use external fixation. When's a classic example you do external fixation? Um, the poor soft tissue at the fracture site, so That's you right. need to span it or, mm -hmm. and keep um, a link. A link down yeah, what here. else? Um, well, the most common time you're going to do that, the ideal candidate was this patient here. This patient had an open fracture, but also had a compartment syndrome, and so it required um, a large fasciotomy, and the only way you can treat this one is the best way to treat it is with an external fixator because you need to check that wound. So maintain fracture stability, but you're able to check the wound. And here you can see, I, we used at this point what they call Jacob's Ladder, and it was stretched elastically. This is before we had the wound back. Nowadays we would use a wound back with it. And here you can see that gradually closed it and ended up with it closed like this. So this is a good place for external fixators, one of the few in indications. Also, if it's one that is shortened, like this one, this one is shortened past the 10 millimeters, the only way that you can correct that shortening is with an external fixator. This one had three millimeters, put in a long leg cast with the knee extended and the ankle at neutral, and he came back in a week, and now he's got uh, 15 millimeters, which is more than acceptable shortening. So the solution here was that you length was reestablished with an external fixator. Now, this is a real uh, challenge. This is a six-year-old, and the father accidentally backed over the kid's leg. Is it fractured or broken? <laughs> Both. Yeah. So what's the problem here? Segmental. Yeah, it's segmental and you got lots of comminution. So can you treat that with a cast? No. No. Can you treat that with intramesillary nails? That'd be tough. Yeah, well that's because you don't have cortical contact. 
So, what are you going to use? External fixer. Yeah. Can you put two pins in this? It'd be tough, wouldn't yes, it? Yes, sir. So you might you may go to the calcaneus, span the ankle. Yeah, you could do that, or you could do a hybrid. Okay. Yeah. So, that's what was done. Got him out pretty good, and we don't worry so much about the fibula. But here you can see got the tibia pretty well aligned. And here's a unipolar for proximally, and then a ring fixator distally in the foot. So and it's actually a hybrid system. And here you can see what you can do. You can actually, you got enough bone down here, you can put pins, and usually these are fixed so that you can connect a, a pin fixator to a, a ring fixator, and sometimes that's a good method that you can use, unipolar to a ring fixator. And then you, you can actually, if you have trouble with the ring fixator, you can actually extend it to the foot. But this one, there was enough bone here distally that we were able to put two pins in there and hold it. So that's also a fixator's ideally for with bone loss. And here's a boy that was hit by a car, 15-year-old, he had a grade two fracture and so it was debrided, and he had an external fixator. Uh-oh, what's going on here? He's missing some bone, huh? So he's got a big defect after we put, extended him to the normal length. Here you can see it a little bit better. He's got a big defect. Can you accept that? What are you going to do? Well, he's, something's missing. So where's the bone? Put me on the street. You're right, exactly right. Then we went to the accident <laughs> scene, and there it is out there. The <laughs> <laughs> Look at it, there it is out in the street. <laughs> you gonna take that and put that in there? No, probably I think not. it'd be all right out yeah. on the street. It's probably been run over a couple times. Yes, sir. Yeah. So this is an ideal candidate for bone transplant. So what we did was we cut out that little spike, and so with this type of fixator. We were able to close the fracture site, just close it uh, acutely. You gotta be a little bit careful in that. Sometimes it's a problem when you close them acutely and you compress the defect, which will hail staining. Then you'll lengthen them proximally. And so this is what happened. You can see that he's starting to put in bone and he's healed that distal fracture. And this is the final thing. So this is a good place if you've got bone loss, how you can treat it is with a what we call bone transpl transport. Now, plates and screws, we don't see that very much in children. And it requires a pretty extensive dissection to remove. Do you need to take the plates off? No. Well, our experience has been in the lower extremities in children, if you leave the plates on, it's a real stress area, and there's a high incidence of fracture right at the end of the plate. So it does need to come off, but to take it off, you gotta use the whole incision. And so it's indicated that there's an associated compartment syndrome. Uh, there is, uh, where you can get rid of this, you, you can use submuscular, not as you have submuscular plating and decrease the amount of uh, dissection. And it's also a useful hemophiliac where rigid fixation is needed. And a hemophiliac, if you have continued motion, they'll continue to bleed. So this one we had was treated elsewhere with the plates and screws, and we took uh, take the plate off and leaves a pretty good sized defect. So uh, plates rarely are used. If you got a lot of comminution, you can use it. Or actually, you can they have to use the periosteal sleeve, and you can just put an external fixator and it'll fill in. And so it required post-removal and minimization because you actually, when you take the plate out, you got those holes and you'll have a fracture if you don't immobilize it until they fill in. So we've talked about this. Remember that most pediatric fractures can be treated non-operatively, but you need to evaluate and see what type of fracture pattern it is. Is it just simple transverse, isolated, transverse fibula and tibia, isolated 
tibial shaft with oblique, or if it's oblique, tibia and fibula. Each of those requires a different method of treatment, but you need to, it's very important that you look at it first before you make your treatment. And also don't be uh, worried, I mean, don't be um, blindsided by that proximal tibia fracture. Tell the parents ahead of time that you don't have any control about it and it may occur. So thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you.